Welcome, everybody, to the Unnormalized Podcast. This is your host, Frankie A., with another great guest that I have here today with me on the Unnormalized Podcast to talk all things life unnormalized. I have stage actress Kelsey Swiger. 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 Okay, you okay great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and um, I'm really excited to talk to her today because um, of one of her current roles that she's currently in right now and which gives me like life beyond life itself Um, (laughs) she is currently playing Maureen Johnson in the 25th right 25th anniversary tour is still the 20th anniversary tour we are in the fourth year of the 20th anniversary tour, so it's almost 25, but still okay. celebrating 20 years, but yes. Gotcha. So she is in the touring company of, like, my all-time favorite um, Broadway show, Rent. So for all you Rent fans out there, this one is for you, okay? <laughs> um, and check out who, you, who Kelsey is and such a fan of what you do. Um so before we get into all that, uh, I like to just talk to my guests and start off with kind of like where where you where you're from because I I, I I I do social work for a living, so I find it fascinating to find out where people come from, their mm-hmm. environment, their family, and things like that because I think it lends to who they are and the best that they do now. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from, family stuff like that. Yeah. I was born and raised in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, so not too far from where you are. That's right. Um, And lived there my whole life until I was 18 and graduated from high school. Um, My family, there's no other really performers in my family. Um, I get asked that a lot. I think everyone, you know, does, you know, oh, how did you get into this? You know, does does your mom sing? Does your dad sing? Um, There's a couple musicians in my extended family, uncles and... um, and things like that, but I'm really the only one who does this, but my family is very supportive. I'm very lucky that I have that luxury of a supportive and understanding family. Um, I am my mother's only child. My mom and I are very, very close. Um, My father has sons from a previous marriage, but um, so I have half brothers, but they're much older than I am, so pretty much on my own for my upbringing. It rocked. My mom's awesome. We had a great time. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> better, I think. I, I always say, like, now that I'm in, you know, full-grown, like, adult mode and in my 20s, I'm like, Mom, thank you so much for... For, <laughs> for, helping, for helping me learn how to adult. You know, I'm, I'm still yeah. trying to figure... I'm still trying to... I'm 43, and I'm still trying to figure that one out, so... I don't know if we ever stop figuring it out, but um, uh, it's it's... It's nice that there's, I don't have to really like share her or her advice or her time or, you know, her help when I need it with anyone else. So, um, you know, while I lack the sibling uh, sort of bond, um, I had a, I've, I love my life. It's, it's re- really no complaints. Um, but yeah, then I went to college at Shenandoah Conservatory, which is a, a, they have a BFA musical theater program there. It's in Winchester, Virginia. Okay. So really, two hours down Highway 81, Interstate 81, is where I went to school. Um, graduated with a musical theater degree and moved to New York City. And I've been based in New York City since, um, I guess, since May of 2016. Really. Oh, okay, good. Uh, yeah. Um, and and I did read in your bio that were you a swimmer? I was. I grew up, I was a competitive swimmer uh, for a long time. Um, And I almost, I really almost considered going to like college for that, sort of like going after scholarships and going to a a university before I discovered theater. Mm -hmm. Um, I I came into it sort of later than some of my theater friends growing up. You know, everyone is like, oh, when I did Oliver and when I did Annie and, you know, all of these things when they're, because they've been doing it since they were little kids. Yeah. and um, I I didn't do my first musical until I was 14 years old. I got to high school and um, 
the school announced that the spring musical was going to be guys and dolls. And I said, okay, that sounds fun. Um, I was a dancer my whole life. So I was like researching the show. I watched the movie. I was watching clips on YouTube and I said, I could totally be a hot box girl. Cause I could go dance, you know? And, um, I ended up as a freshman getting Adelaide. And oh, nice. I just like, lo- there was nothing. What's not to love. I, yeah. I mean, it was just so, you know, about the show, about the role, about, theater in general I was completely smitten and so that is when swimming sort of took the back seat and I was like wait I can go to school for musical theater this is a thing that people do and um yeah guys and dolls was sort of my gateway drug to uh gotcha. is what I say and the reason why I ask about swimming is because I used to swim that's why so when I find a fellow swimmer I'm like well, which what which stroke did you swim I was a pretty good breaststroker. And a- <laughs> yes! <laughs> That's amazing. Um, also, honestly, I loved doing the I Am. I think my best event when I got to, like, sort of my peak was, like, the 200 I Am. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved doing all of them. And I think just because, you know, different muscle groups are required to do each stroke. Yeah. So, um you sort of give certain parts of your body a break and you were like, every time I did the next 50, like it was just like a reset and I like variety. So why not have a little medley? (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Little medley has never hurt anybody. Um, And, and it's, it's great because like we have similar paths in common because um, I was a swimmer and um, I got into, um, I danced hip hop for like 20 years or so. Never like, totally professionally just doing a lot of choreography and stuff for like community um organizations and a lot of youth-based programs but i found that um swimming was something that prepared me for that um stamina things like that and keeping the body you know aware of how hands and feet and legs and all that kind of stuff are moving around um so it's interesting that you you know interesting segue that you went right into dancing yeah well, yeah, it's funny because I was, I, I, I danced from, my mom put me in like ballet class when I was four mm-hmm. and I loved it. And I danced my whole life. I was a classically trained point ballerina oh, nice. and my, um, my dance teachers loved that I swam and my swim coaches loved that I danced because yeah. the two really do, as you know, the two complement each other so well because you need the strength and the stamina and the athleticism to be a dancer. But then also I was very graceful. I understood hydrodynamics because yeah. I understood the way my body moved and worked and um, yeah, the two complemented each other wonderfully. But my mom always made the joke, um, yeah, she's a lot better on land than she is in the water. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> I was a decorated swimmer, I will say. I, I was a championship meet swimmer, but um, she just was, like I said before, my family's been very supportive of my career path and choices, and um, she's been my number one champion always. So she just she loved that I sang and acted and danced, and she loved those events, and so she got very excited about them, I think. And... Um, you know, she, she was saying like, yeah, I mean, as good as she is in the water, like we will keep her dry. Cause like, I think that's where, I think that's where her, uh, her chips might, you know, really start to add up. So. Well, lucky um, for, lucky for us, mom did push you in, into that, that direction. Um, so you were 14 when you first kind of like got that bug, um, yeah. in guys and dolls and, um, I love talking to people about like that whole experience because, there's something about that moment where you're like, wow, this is something that's not just a, like a hobby or, or a, something I do like leisure time or things getting involved in school and stuff like that. Yeah. When you get bit by that bug, it's like nothing like you've ever experienced before. It's like almost like an inner voice kind of kicks in and says, Hey, you know, there's something here or there, you mm-hmm. know, and I got it's, by that bug hard. I got bit real hard. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and, and it's not so much like a lot of people think that, um, especially at a young age that people kind of get into it because of an audience and you know what I mean? Like just trying to seek attention or something like that, but it's something when you're 
the audience is recognizing you for a talent that kind of keeps you propelling forward to try, okay, well, I'm getting this type of reaction. Um, what can I, what's the next thing that I can do to develop myself and this craft that I'm building so I can maybe move it, keep it moving in towards a professional way yeah. of doing this as a career. And that's, Kelsey, the whole premise of this show is that speaking to people who um, follow a unconventional path and mm -hmm. There's probably nothing more unconventional than getting into acting um, mm -hmm. and then even more so into theater. Um, yeah. So how how w was it at that point when you did Guys and Dolls that you were thinking like this is where I need to, like mom was recognizing things, but were you, did you have it like in your mind that, okay, this is it? I'm, 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 I really I'm, did. I really did. And I think that that's why mom was so on board with it. She, she saw, she, she always says like, she saw something in me that she wasn't even going to try to fight because she knew that she couldn't. And, um, you know, I don't know what you see in a 14 year old kid, but I guess, you know, I just, I just loved it so much. I guess it's just a love. You see a love, you see a need, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this really big desire to, to do this. And I mean, I just, then I just completely, you know, became obsessed with Broadway cast albums, left and right, everything I could find, um, you know, researching actors and people who had done these shows and what else they did. Um, very shortly at, while I was in rehearsals for Guys and Dolls, I discovered Rent, I discovered Wicked, you know, and, and I just was in awe. I was in awe. I was in love. Um, Rent has been a dream show of mine since, that time since 14 and I was so taken aback by Adina Menzel's voice and listening to her on these cast albums and the work that she had been doing and um because of her Maureen was always something that I wanted to do and this is the first time I've ever gotten to do Rent I've waited the the the, the wait has been worth it but the wait has been long <laughs> and, uh, you know it's, it's paying off quite beautifully now because I'm with this beautiful company with this beautiful opportunity to play this role and um yeah because of all of this because of how deeply I dove I think my that's that's the whole thing of like my mom kind of threw her hands up and said yes this is what she wants to do so this is what we're looking at and um there was no turning back I've never considered a a different career path um I don't know what else that would be, to be completely honest. Um, I've just never really had a plan B for myself because I have always thought if I have a plan B, then that means that I don't believe in myself that the plan A is going to work out. That's right. Uh, so, you know, I just went full force balls to the wall with, you know, this expensive little BFA that I wanted to get from college. And, um, you know, living in New York is, is not easy. It's not always convenient. It is loud. It you know it's sensory overload 100% of the time, mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots of roadblocks and frustrations from you know people bumping into you on the sidewalk to the MTA running an hour behind, to there being too many people in line at the Starbucks for you to get your drink. Like whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. it's not easy. But I love it. I love being a part of that community, and I think that everything. I think that 14-year-old Kelsey would be very happy to know that 25 year old Kelsey is where she is Yeah. Um, because this was just, just the dream living in New York, having, a, having an apartment in New York. I mean, that is like mind blowing. Yeah. For, and for, for, I mean, I live, I grew up in New Jersey, you grew up in PA. So for us, like New York is always a hop, skip and a jump. So that is like for anybody, whether you're in whatever field that you're in, like New York city for us on the East coast is like the Mecca where everyone wants to go. And yeah. we all know how difficult it is to, you know, sustain a, a life in, it's very expensive, it's very busy. Um, it could be very, you know, I, I don't want to say cutthroat, but it, it's very, it's very aggressive, yeah, <laughs> you know? I mean, doggy dog city in, yeah. in a lot of ways, yeah. Yes, it could, it could definitely, a great city, probably one of my favorite in the world, and, but it can chew you up and spit you out if you don't have the oh, right, yes. <laughs> the right, the right, you know, acumen for it all, you know, so, um, 
the dream usually for an actor at everybody who not is would either be LA or New York. Mm-hmm. Um, so for, for Kelsey to wind up where she is now at such a young age um, and is, is a great thing. It's what all the actors, but you know what I'm thinking? Like that probably stems from your determination and your ability to kind of handle a challenge like that from, you know, and just meeting you and hearing your backstory a lot of it probably came from that competitive um, athleticism and then moving into like the intensity of and demanding situation that comes with ballet in general. Yeah. Um, so all those were kind of like factors or building your, your foundation to yeah. be prepared for all that, you know? I definitely have my, my discipline, um, to you know, I, I have my my ballet instructor to thank for that, and she taught me so much. Um, sadly, she's no longer with us, but um, I remember, you know, the day that she the day that she passed, it was uh, last year. I just thought I was sitting in my apartment in New York City, and I just thought this woman is so so much why I'm here. Mm-hmm. Um, and her name was Joellen, and Joellen taught me, you know. Uh, showmanship. She taught me how to perform. She taught me how to pre- taught me how to present. And you know, she also was the hard ass that a ballet instructor needs to be. And mm-hmm. you know, she wasn't afraid to, you know, discipline and mom us and correct us and you know, be gentle. But um, she was definitely like the ballet instructor that you see in, you know, very serious and and rigid. This is the way it works. Yeah. It's a- yes and a no there's a black and a white to this craft so that has always been interesting and has definitely affected me even going into other dance styles where things are more fluid i'm i'm really not a great hip-hop dancer because there are no rules (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. it's very much like freestyle based yeah and that doesn't work in my ballet brain like it's just you know i i freak out a little bit so um you know, and sometimes even like working on different musical theater jazz styles can be a big challenge because I'm like, how is this actually supposed to be? What do you mean you want this turned in? It has to be turned out, you know, yeah. even things that come down to that. But um, yeah, definitely the the competitiveness of being an athlete. I also was when I was very little, um, like elementary and middle school age, I played softball as well. I love baseball. I love sports. I'm like so into all of that stuff. So um, always have been a huge sports family. Um, and so I definitely understand all of that, even though I'm not a pro athlete or, you know, a pro, well, I guess, I mean, it's, it's a competitive market. What I do there, there is a lot of competition, um, obviously in the, in the acting world and in the musical theater, New York city community. Yeah. Um, equal parts, discipline and competition. (laughs) Well, well, it's, it's paying off, you know, Mm -hmm. and um you know that's just an testament to i mean your body of work that you've done previously to rent because we'll get to rent but you Mm -hmm. have done so much stuff before that um so yeah uh, and some great like major theatrical productions Mm -hmm. of some great classics um so why don't you tell some people about um go take us from that 14 year old um, Kelsey, who was in Guys and Dolls, to how did it how did it progress to yeah. to that to getting all these roles? Yeah. Um, well, I have to say that being so young, I mean, you know, high school. Picture this. You know, there's this pecking order. There's this sort of ladder that you have to wait to climb. Only time will tell you know, when you can get to the top to that senior year or whatever. And it was very interesting being a freshman and, um, and having the opportunity that I did with the show because it immediately sort of put me into a pool of upperclassmen friends. And, um, it taught me very quickly, you know, what like leadership means and what sort of being watched means. You have to be very careful, um, what people see and how you act um, I was sort of under a microscope, which can be scary, but I think in the long run has paid off because um, it's just taught me to, you know, there's always these voices in, my, in the back of my mind of like, you know, what does this look like? So um, 
it just made me want to go more and more, more, more. What can I do now? What can I do now? I've had this, like, this was really cool. I loved that. How can I do more? So then, you know, every year I was involved with my high school show. I got involved with community theater in my, um, in my hometown, um, did shows there. And, um, my first professional job, my first paying theater job was the summer after my freshman year of college. Um, I completed my freshman year with a, a job at a, at a summer stock, um, which was actually on my college's campus. So Shenandoah Conservatory in the summertime uses their facilities, their proscenium theater. It's like an eight or 900 seat theater. Wow. And they they have a professional summer stock that performs there in the summertime and they hire equity actors. They audition in New York and all over the country. And they do, when I did it, it was four shows that they did a summer. Now I think um, Shenandoah summer music, music theater uh, typically produces three a summer, but it's very rigorous. Um, so that summer looked a little, little bit like this. We did Les Mis, we did Chicago, we did Crazy For You, and we did Shrek. So my first professional theater gig, I show up day one of rehearsals. We rehearse Les Miserables for two weeks. A typical theater um, rehearsal schedule is um, Tuesday through Sunday. Monday is always like the, the equity dark day. So mm -hmm. Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to 6, we were rehearsing Les Mis. We opened Les Mis, had an opening night party, everything swell. The next morning at 10 a.m., we started rehearsals for Chicago. So then we were rehearsing Chicago during the day and performing Les Mis at night for two weeks. Les Mis closes, Chicago opens. The morning after we open Chicago, we start rehearsals for Crazy For You. So then we're rehearsing Crazy For You during the day, performing Chicago at night for two weeks. Chicago closes, we open Crazy For You. The next day, we start rehearsals for Shrek. We're rehearsing Shrek during the day. And so, it, you know, it goes on. And, and that is something that is wild. I don't know why we do that to ourselves, um, but uh, but summer stock is a very common thing. It's it's a very effective way to produce a lot of shows for a regional theater's um, market of mm -hmm. ticket buyers, um, and also using the same company of. Typically, there's there's a lot of. Um, people who remain for the whole season. Maybe they hire, you know, when we did Les Mis, our Valjean and Javert were only there for that one show. But for the most part, there's a lot of people that stay the whole time. So um, wow, that's, that's nuts. <laughs> that's what that is. But it's, I think it's something that everyone in the field should experience at least once because it, it goes back to the discipline thing. It's like, how can I set my brain on learning this material while still maintaining what we've set for the show that I have to do tonight at eight o'clock? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so that was my very first professional job. I was 19. And um, once again, then it's just kind of like, okay, well, I did summer stock. I did the same thing the following summer, also at Shenandoah Summer Music Theater. I did another summer stock season with them. Um, the second summer, we did Man of La Mancha, which I got to play Aldanza in. I loved, loved, loved that. One of my favorite roles I've ever played. Probably like second to Maureen is Aldanza. Um, and that was great because I was also, I, I'm, I was always a soprano voice growing up. Um, and I love rock music always. So I was, I was good at sort of figuring out the, the rock sounds, the heavier belt sounds, whatever. But um, Aldanza was cool because she's very feisty, very, very chest belt sound in a lot of the time. But she also flips up into this nice soprano sound. So as a singer, that was fun to explore. But we did, um, yeah, we did Man of La Mancha, we did Spam a lot, we did The King and I, and we did Mary Poppins. You know, you you so said spam, you said Spam a lot. Um, actually, uh, one of my old employers, I can't say his name, but mm -hmm. he actually was in like a local production of Spam a lot, and I had never seen. The, I've heard of it, but I've never seen. What a great, great show! Um, it is. Such a good show. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, so yeah, I, what an impressive, like, I guess something that Summerstock, maybe what they intend to do is kind of, especially for maybe not so much for the equity um, performers, uh, but for someone like yourself who's a student, um, to really give you like a um, an immersive experience where if this is something that you want to do for 
professionally. Uh, it kind of mm-hmm. weeds. It kind of will weed out who's gonna make it or who and who's not. You know, um, I mean, because if you can handle that, that's a really good point, actually. And I, I would say that it did because the the school employs a fair amount of Shenandoah students in the summer, as you could imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, because you know, the, the facilities, like I said, are right there. So they hold auditions on campus um, in the spring. And um, yeah, it definitely, you know, there, there's a select few people who leave that summer experience saying, oh, yeah, I want to do that again. Yeah. Um, I also, I did another sort of similar process then at at a regional theater, a great, great, great regional house called Flat Rock Playhouse, which is in um, like Western North Carolina in like the beautiful mountains of the Carolinas. And um, I spent a summer there and I worked with some amazing people um, and did How to Succeed in Business. Great, great show. And our company, like all of our principal players had, yeah, they, all of our principal players in both of those shows had Broadway credits. Um, Richard J. Hines uh, directed and choreographed How to Succeed for us, and um, he is a Broadway associate director. He worked on Newsies. He worked on Come From Away. Um, he worked on 9 to 5. He is a, is a decorated Broadway choreography vet. So um, it was wonderful working with him. Um, and that, once again, that was sort of another step, another level of, of a challenge, another level of this is real and this is hard and this is, you know, um, but for some reason, I'm just one of those crazy people who gives it one and more. I just, I just always say, well, okay, check that box. What's next? Um, so yeah. And then that's sort of how I spent my summers. I was lucky enough that I spent every summer in between my college years working. Good, good, good. I mean, and that's only going to hone your craft so much more, um, to prepare you for, so when, now let's fast forward a little bit. How how did um, the audition for Rent come about? Was it something like you sought after, or was there some? Because I, the reason why I'm asking is because you are such like the perfect Maureen. Like, <laughs> thank you. I'm thank a, you. I'm a Rent <laughs> expert. Okay, I would like to think that I am, but like you fit perfectly in who I would think that they would want to cast for the character of Maureen Johnson. Um, well, it's funny actually that you ask about the, how the audition came about. Cause this is one of my favorite stories to sort of tell. Um, so the tour, the 20th anniversary tour of Rent went out in 2016 because the show opened on Broadway originally in 1996. Mm-hmm. So 20 years later, the original Broadway team, original choreographer, original associate director, um, original costume designer, original music supervisor, all of these people say, we want to sort of revive this show in tour form. So it's the same costumes, it's the same set, it's the same choreography, it's the same show that was put on the original cast, which is Mm -hmm. just why I have to say. Um, You know, the fact that I'm walking the same same tracks and motions that Adina Menzel and Eden Espinosa and Aaron Kearney and all these people did is just nuts. So um, we all pinch ourselves every day for that. But when the tour first went out in 2016, I received, I I knew the casting director at the time and um, she called me in for a Maureen appointment. And I was a senior in, in college at the time. It was March of my senior year, and I thought to myself, oh, my God, this is incredible. I, it was my first big New York City callback. I just, like, I got so excited. And um, anyway, I, I made it pretty far in the process. Um, I made it to, like, a final callback land, and I did not book it. And I was just crushed. I was just crushed because, it, like I said, it was my first big New York City callback experience. So yeah. Um, and it's right. You said that you had such an affinity tour to it before you even were cast in it. So, yes. yeah. So that was 2016 and they, you know, they cast their first, um, their first cast of the, of the tour and they went out and, um, 
you know, did such a good job that they kept they kept it out for, you know, now, like I said, four years. This is the mm -hmm. fourth year of the 20th anniversary tour. So um, ever since then, ever since moving to New York and things, whenever there was a rent open call, I would go. Even though I had been in the system before as a Maureen, even though I was on file, um, I would go to the open calls. I would line up early in the morning, you know, to be seen. And um, the the original casting director for the tour actually handed off that she moved out to California and now works out there. So she sort of forfeited her New York City based um, national tours and handed them over to another casting office. So now I was kind of like, well, I don't have this connection anymore because I knew her very well. I need to sort of build up my reputation with this with this new office. So I would go in for them and I wouldn't even get a callback. I would go into the open calls and I wouldn't get callbacks for rent. And I just kind of thought to myself, maybe they don't see me as a Maureen. Maybe, you know, when they saw me in the final a couple years ago, they, they just were like, yeah, this is whatever, but it's not the right fit. So I kind of honestly wrote rent off for a very mm. long time because I was like, I guess it's just not meant for me. Yeah. Um, last year, I ended up going in, in 2018. I ended up going through many final callback processes for the Kinky Boots National Tour. Um, which I eventually booked. And um, it's the same casting office that now has rent. So um, I booked the Kinky Boots National Tour. I was on tour with Kinky Boots from um, December 2018 through June 2019. And in early May of 2018, the, the whole casting office came to see our show. And after the show, one of the head casting directors pulled me aside and said, hey, so we need a Maureen, and I'm looking at you up on stage tonight, and I'm thinking to myself, I may have just solved my problem. Those were her words to me in this theater lobby. And I'm, you know, playing it cool because I'm, yeah. I'm kind of like, I've been there before. I've been yeah. through the Maureen process, and I didn't get this. You know, so I was like, you know, she was just saying, um, I would like to have you send a tape um, because obviously I was still on the road with Kinky Boots. So she, she was like, I'll have you send a tape and see, you know, where that goes. And maybe you don't have to come to New York for the final callback. Like maybe it would be, you know, I said, yeah, just let me know. So I ended up filming a tape for them, um, sent that in, got a final callback from the tape, uh, flew to New York from the Kinky Boots tour, missed like two days of Kinky Boots, um, to go do my rent final callback. Um, it went very well. They ended up asking for a little bit more material from me. They wanted to, the director was in London at the time. It was all very scattered. Um, the director was in London, so he had some notes and sort of gave me like a work session via email. And I refilmed. And after I refilmed, I got the offer. And I, I got the offer with about a week of Kinky Boots left. And wow. I just was beside myself that a i did it i booked the role that i had wanted for so long um and i persevered through this kind of unconventional you want to talk about unnormalized this yeah, was right? a conventional audition process um through you know multiple tapes and going in from the road and not being able to meet the full team because this was sort of an extra fragment um, audition process because there were just a couple tracks that they were needing to fill in the tour, Maureen being one of them, mm -hmm. and um, sending more tapes again, and then it just, my gosh, but I felt so fortunate that I was leaving one national tour knowing that I was going to join another. Yeah. I just, I was mind blown that that was going to be my story to tell and experience. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people in New York City trying to do this exact thing. And more specifically, there are a lot of women. There are just so many women. And I think of so many friends and so many people that I know from, from gigs in the city, concerts and readings and workshops of new musical theater that I've done. And um, just my close friends in the industry who I know are so capable of doing you know, this type of job. And somehow it's mine. Um, so that's just a humbling thing to think about because yeah. you, can be, you can be experienced, you can be hardworking, you can be talented, but at the same time, most people living in New York City are those things. Yeah. So the fact that 
I had that experience. That's how the, that's how the rent audition came about. I was on tour and I was just lucky that it was that connection and that sort of got my foot in the door and, um, here I am. Well, <laughs> just, and, just and I'm on for the ride. I just, I, I, I commend you for that because through all that whole process, which could jade some people about the industry, especially doing a couple of, um, really great productions and then having like that dream kind of built into your head and then mm -hmm. it's not it's not moving the way that it normally moves and um it's not panning out you know you're coming back and forth to it um i think it's it's very commendable kelsey and i i I just love talking to people about journeys like that because mm -hmm. it sends a message young and old that um, when you have a dream and you have a vision for yourself, that all these obstacles will present themselves um, mm -hmm. and try to deter you from going, you know, you're at the crossroads. You could either turn left or right um, or back or just totally run back the opposite way. Yeah. Um and it's up to you to kind of stay the course. Um, and if that's something that you're really passionate about, dedicated. I tell a lot of people, especially um, people who are like, I'm a pop culture person. I love everything that has to do with the arts. Um, and I tell people that this is, we get to see like the end product on stage we get to enjoy everything that the cast somebody like yourself an actress like yourself um gives to the audience but we rarely get to hear stories like that um and we really don't get to know how much work that you guys put into the roles that you play especially there's something about musical theater that I also think people don't realize. I, I'm a, I love musical theater. Um, I have such a respect for what you do and what um, people in your, your genre do because it's so demanding of, mm -hmm. of everything. Um, you know, the physical, the mental, um, you guys have to be triple threat. You have to sing, you have to act, you have to dance. Like it's a little different than, you know, what seeing people on, on the big screen. Um, mm -hmm. There is no do-overs. There is no cut. Yeah. There is no, okay, let's run that back again. Um, <laughs> you know, um, so it takes a certain amount of moxie is the only other word that I can think of that will... That's a good word. Yeah, that will put somebody like yourself in the situation that you're in now. Um, and that's the message that I think your whole story here kind of is going to be left with the audience that watches this and listens is that if you want something you there's there's going to be a million no's but there is going to be that one yes and that's the yes that you have to keep striving for um i mean it's also so common in the musical theater industry especially with shows as big as you know there's sort of this category of like music theater that everyone has at least heard of you know even if you're not a musical theater fan chances are you've heard about rent chances are you've heard about hamilton chances yeah. are you've heard about wicked chances are you've heard about the phantom of the opera and when when shows sort of reach a level that is close to or near that tier of fame and name recognition in a show title um producers and creative teams are very careful who they pick for those shows and when. And what what sometimes people who, who don't, well, what almost all of the time, people who don't do this don't understand is that you go in for those shows, sometimes eight, nine, 10, 11, 13 times. Literally, I have friends who have been in for the Book of Mormon, like, 13 times and they're like am I ever going to book this show? I don't know. I like to think that they will because if you're right for something enough for them to bring you so far into the process they will as long as you're on the file they're going to keep bringing you in but um it takes a lot of a lot of times going through that process and as the actor you know there comes a point where you you receive an email that says audition appointment for so and so angelica in hamilton and you freak out because you're like oh my gosh i just got this appointment you know I, i've had so many friends in this exact position with the show 
and um, there are five companies of Hamilton right now. And so there's a lot of people that they need, but they still are very, very selective of who they actually choose to do that job. And um, just because you get that appointment doesn't, you know, you tell your friends and your family, oh, I have this big callback. And then they're like, okay, well, like, when will you find out? When will you know? Mm-hmm. And the answer is always, chances are never. Never. Chances yeah. Are all never. Here. And especially, um, like you said, that big of a that big of a show, like Red, like Hamilton, it almost becomes like a brand. Yeah, you know what I mean within itself. That, and I guess that's why I, I said to you, you were like the perfect Maureen because of the fact that that's what the brand kind of. I mean, full disclosure, I saw the original cast. Wow. Um, Funny, my my story with Ren is kind of funny. Is um, I started dating my wife at the time. Well, mm-hmm. she still is. She still is my wife, but she was my girlfriend at the time. At the time. And um, I worked in. I was in theater groups myself when I was younger. Um, always kind of try to stay involved in uh, the arts, especially performing arts and theater and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. And I was watching. I think it was like Good Morning America or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I had to be probably, you said it was like 96, you said. 96, it opened. It yeah. ran through 2008. But the, yeah. I mean, yeah, the original cast would have been there like 96 to 97, maybe. So I saw this cast of actors talking mm-hmm. to Good Day, Good Morning America about this show and you know they were explaining the premise of it and how it was about um, you know at that point like the AIDS epidemic and 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 you know different people types in New York City and I was like you know they actually I think performed a song and I was like this is nothing like I have ever seen on Broadway before um, it was it was Something that I actually was like, I automatically felt connected to. Like I saw myself as just somebody like normal. Well, I hate that word normal, but, you know, (laughs) just living everyday life. um, And I feel like I was being represented in that show. Um, And so I was like, I have to get tickets for this. So I wind up getting tickets. um, Had no idea other than that what I was walking into and got to see the original cast of Rent and was like, it was like life changing. And for myself and for my wife, it became instantaneously like something that we felt like needed to stay in our lives. It wasn't just a show. It was like, we saw ourselves, we saw family members, we saw friends in the cast, in the music. It was like nothing like I had ever seen music wise, like where I'm a rock and roll type of guy. I love hip hop music. And it was just a mixture of everything. And I was like, this is fucking bad ass. Like, this yeah. is like not your mama's Broadway show. You know not what I mean? Broadway show, yeah. Especially when they start doing contact, I'm like, yeah. wow, like, this is really uh-huh. not, you know, like, I don't know if my mom would be able to sit through this, but I automatically was, like, in love with the show. So um, so when I say, like, you are that, you fit that Maureen, I guess, for lack of a better term, brand, yeah. that um, like, you do. Like, that's why it's so interesting to hear that story. Um that even where, where I like with, with people like yourself to tell is that even though we, the receivers, um, mm-hmm. see the end product, it's, it's just a long road to get there. There is a long road to get there. And I, I'm so happy that you said you said so many things that I think everyone, whether they realize it or not, everyone experienced when they saw Rent for the first time. The reason why Rent, you know, we get asked all the time, like, isn't it sort of a period piece? It's set in the 90s. There's so much about it with references and costume pieces and all these things that are so quintessential 1990s. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what makes it still relevant today? And um, while that is true, I think it is locked in now, even just, you know, 24 years later, I think it is locked in sort of as a period piece. 
but it's, it's messages of um, love and life and loss and also community. What I really think Rent is about at its core is a group of people. It's, it's representative of a community that could exist anywhere. It could exist mm -hmm. in Wyoming. It could exist in Russia. It could exist in, in New York City, Florida, wherever, um, of people wanting to find their purpose, wanting to leave their mark, and also wanting, wanting to be loved and accepted for exactly who they are. Um, and that is a big thing for Maureen, for me. I mean, I sing, take me for what I am, who mm -hmm. I was to be. Yeah. This is who I am and you're like, I'm great, you're great, we love each other, why not just, why not just love each other? You know, that is sort of what that whole thing is about. Mm -hmm. um, and while there are other problems at stake um, at the core, that's really what it's about. But people came to see the show and it talked about so many things that had never been talked about on a Broadway stage before. And it involved a group of people that that cast was so groundbreaking because of the diversity in it. But it's, there's no other way to tell a story about New York City without diversity. Absolutely. No you need Asians, you need Hispanics, you need white people, black people, everything in between. So, um, you know, you have an interracial lesbian couple, you have an interracial gay couple, you have people who are HIV positive and have AIDS and are talking about that. Yeah. Um, th and there were so many people who sat there and looked up at the stage and said, this is me. And, you know, you could, you know, there's a straight white guy, there's, uh, you know, there's yeah. a female, you know, there's like, there's literally something for everyone's storytelling perspective in the show. Um, and all of the, but all of the struggles, even though they are very pertinent and specific to New York daily life, they exist everywhere. And I think that's why it's persevered for as long as it has. Yes. Um, top of the fact that people fell in love with it the way that they did. Because we also meet so many people who say, like you just said, I didn't really know what I was walking into, but I was with my, you know, now wife, my now partner, my, you know, whatever it was. And we just couldn't believe what we were watching. And so we hear that there's a tour coming to our town and we have to go see it. And 20 years later, it's just as good. Thank you so much for doing this. It's just, it's, I, I said this earlier about, you know, things being humbling, but it really is humbling to be a part of something so large. It's rent is larger than any of us together individually. It is just this whole thing that um, shaped the musical theater industry for sure, yeah. but also sort of took the world by a bit of storm, especially for the 1990s. You know, we didn't have social media. We didn't, you know, these things didn't spread like wildfire. We didn't have, um, you know, Hamilton mixtapes and Hamilton lotteries online. Like it wasn't as accessible as today's standards of, of spreading knowledge and news. Yeah, absolutely. I And, and I think what was also um, very groundbreaking for Rent is those people represented, like you said, real people and mm -hmm. a real community out there, but didn't have a voice. Even in 96, um, you would think, you know, that there would be, but there we were just like on the brink of same-sex marriages and, and um, you know, um, interracial couples like being like really accepted. So yeah. I, I feel like Rent, also gave a voice and a platform for a lot of these topics um, mm -hmm. that were quote unquote taboo for people to talk about and embrace them, um, which always allows for a bigger conversation and a bigger dialogue about the underlying topics that go through um, all that kind of stuff that holds those demographics and those communities down. Um, and that's what always has helped, even though it may be kind of like a period piece, but kind of made it sustainable. Like I talk to um, a lot of people who have like rent in common and it's like kids today are just loving it. You know what I mean? And people my age who saw the original cast still love it and will still come out and, and see every touring company that they can yeah. because it, it almost became like a subculture of renters, you know what I mean, out there. Yeah. It's also become a generational thing because now, like I said, you know, there's people who saw the show 20 years ago and now they're, you know, they're married and they have children and they want to expose their children to the story because um, 
of how much it meant to them. And mm-hmm. so they're, you know, they're like, I just need to share with my children or my child how much this meant to me. And I hope it has the same effect on them. I'm sure it will. Um, and we love that. We, you know, we see so many young people at the stage door meeting us afterward. And while it's a tough show, I mean, you know, definitely like viewer discretion advised, like know what you're doing yeah. before you bring like a 10 year old. But um, it's, it's very cool to see people so eager and excited to the story. And I love that young people are being exposed to it because while well, yes, there's, you know, there's harsh language, there's, um, you know, drugs and sex and, you know, not really nudity, but like, you know, there's just like tough things. Mm -hmm. How cool Mm -hmm. that young people are being exposed to this story that is ultimately about love and about shapes and forms that love takes. Um, I, that makes me really excited as a performer in the piece, because that is the thing that withstands the time. Um, Love always wins. It's, it's honestly, it's why we don't lose Mimi at the end. Um, because love is stronger and you know that gets a lot of slack sometimes in views of the structure of the show and especially in comparison to its la boheme roots because the character of mimi dies at the end um our mimi comes back because you know i i was i was in a tunnel headed for this warm white light angel was there she told me go back and listen to that boy's song you two belong together you and rob have have had problems but you are right for each other you belong together and love is stronger than this don't give up go back um and that's what we get to leave people with we get to leave no day but today go out and live go out and live because tomorrow is not for any of us anything can happen and that is just such an excite i get so excited to go play maureen and tell the story and see how it, how people respond to it afterward. I, I, it's, I could go on and on. <laughs> no, I, I can too. I can I can talk day for days of, upon days of, about rent because there's so much there. There's so many layers beyond just being a music uh, like a totally dope ass musical production, uh, theatrical production. It's it's just so much more to people um, because I feel like, again, like I can't say it enough that they feel like their stories are being represented. And I think you, you said it beautifully what it, the entire, like if someone didn't know, you know, they heard about the buzz about rent and because at this point it's like everywhere and it's a household, you know, name that, you know, brand that kind of comes up and stuff. So um, if they didn't know, the ringing endorsement that the basic level of the messaging is just love, love one another, love each other, love each other unconditionally, love each other for their your differences, uh, embrace those unique qualities. Um, and, and that is something that I think we have lost. Um, and maybe that's why this show has... Um, come back um, as such a big revival now because I think that we are back into, and not to get like political or anything like that, but we are back in a situation where everyone wants to fit neatly into a box and um, Rent kind of blows that open and says, not everybody, everyone shouldn't fit in a box. Um, and, and that's what, in my line of work, I try to convey that to the people that I work with, that the conventional in the box label thing doesn't define who you are. You can pave your own way. You can create your own box. You can create your own circle. You can create your, like, whatever that is for you, just because it's not defined for you, doesn't mean that it shouldn't exist. And, and I think nowadays, because we, we don't know, you know, with the state, you know, on whatever side of the political spectrum you lie right now, it's trying times. So, um, you, people don't always know what to say or do because it's, it's so testy what company you're in. And, um, that's a real shame. I, um, especially for artists who are just looking for ways to express and live and speak truthfully. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a shame for the human connection as well. But, um, y- yeah, like you said, people, people don't fit in the box, and the show represents that. Um, th- but there's also so many 
prescient qualities to Jonathan Larson's writing. Um, he's this like Nostradamus type who just like wrote all this stuff down and then tragically left earth and said, here you go. And um, there's a line, you know, racism, unfortunately, is and well. Homophobia, unfortunately, is still alive and well. The fear of the unknown is all of these things. You know, HIV and AIDS are scary to us because it's we, you don't always know what's going to happen. And especially in the 90s, it was a death sentence. You know, mm -hmm. if you heard the words, you have AIDS, you were you were done. You were done. You were going to be done. And um, there's there's a moment though that I think is so interesting to have been written in the 90s in this show. There's a moment in Act One where um, three police officers come onto the lot and uh, wake the first cop wakes a sleeping homeless person um, and sort of is like messing with her and telling her to, you know to get up and leave and the and the the character that it is is actually this, the female seasons of Love Soloist and Mrs Jefferson it's that sure. tracks tradition it's always been in at least in the Broadway run in this tour setting it's always been a woman of color it's always been like an african-american woman you have a cop messing with mm -hmm. a person of living on the street and mark is standing there with his camera and he's the pretty little white boy on the, the straight white boy on the lot with the camera who says smile for ted koppel officer martin how did jonathan larson put that in right. now living age where the minute any sort of police brutality situation breaks out people are whipping out their phones and they're like do you really want to do that there's this whole horrible horrible situation where we're we're living in with the black lives matter movement where you know this is becoming a, a, a conversation of people acting too quickly and how do we record this how do we prove how do we get there because there's no witnesses when these situations happen but in an age where there were no smartphones, there were no camcorders, we have a filmmaker on the lot who knows that he can say something smart and get away with it. Angel couldn't say that, Collins couldn't say that, Joanne couldn't say that, but Mark can. And um, it's just, I don't know, that is something that we don't bat an eye at. And no. Because something starts to go a little sour or a little awry in a, in a public space, and it's on YouTube in 10 minutes. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, and, and, it's and that I as many times ha, I, I, I can't even count the amount of times that I've heard, watched, read. Um, but when you were so profound in what you said, it literally gave me goosebumps because I never really put the two and two together that way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I always felt that it was way beyond its time. Um, yeah. But when you put it into context like that, um, it, it just gives me an even deeper appreciation for the show um, and, and what Jonathan Larson gave us because we weren't really talking yeah. about those things back then. No. There's also another, these are two like subtle examples of this, um, but they're, I think, my favorite examples of this. There's that moment with the, where Mark says for Ted Koppel. Um, but the other moment happens in act two and it's in one of Alexi Darling's voicemails to Mark. So for those who might not know, Mark is a filmmaker um, and he's being recruited by Buzzline, which is sort of this like sleazy TMZ. kind of, yeah, exactly. Kind of thing. He doesn't really want to stoop to that level, but it's a job. So he's, you know, being recruited by this woman who works for the, for the television company. Her name is Alexi Darling. She's leaving him a voice. And she's saying, you know, hi, I'm just, just me. I'm checking in. I'm vacationing. I'm living at large. I'm in the Hamptons on the beach. And she has a line about just saw Alec and told him you said hi. And I think about that line and the Baldwin brothers and, you know, what, what they were and the, you know, these heartthrobs and, um, you know, they all had careers of their own, but look at where Alec Baldwin is now. You think of it's Alec Baldwin, you know, for my generation, for people in their 20s, we don't really know so much about the Baldwin brothers as Alec Baldwin. Um, no offense to the others of, of them, but he and like, look at who he is in American politics. Now he plays Donald Trump on L. Why was it Alec Baldwin? Why was yeah. it Alec Baldwin that Jonathan put? It could have been any celebrity. Anyone. Yeah. And he put Alec Baldwin in the score. 
and like ah! yeah <laughs> <laughs> this blows my mind. And I'm on stage. I'm on stage every night when that line gets delivered. I'm in sort of like a freeze with Joe where she and I are in a hug. And like the audience can't really see my face. But I'm telling you what, every night that just saw Alec Baldwin told him you said hi. And I'm like, why Alec Baldwin? How did he know? He had to have known. He had he's he's a genius. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean like there are so many pieces of like that now that I'm probably gonna have to go back after having this conversation and uh and maybe that'll happen maybe i'll save that for when i come to you in um in february so i get the authentic you know real i see it when you see it in red bank i bet it'll be like a new set of that is so cool because every time you see it depending on how the world is shaping and moving and what you know what's going on in pop culture and politics and you know electronics even um it's it's sort of a new experience which is also why it's stood the test of time it's just a a great piece of theater it's 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 a it's i I believe that's the only musical to have won the pulitzer prize for drama that's right yes that's right so um you know a big deal (laughs) yeah Yes, a very big deal, and rightfully so. It's deserving. Um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of musical theater, acting, movies, TV is a s- escapism for people, um, and I think that's um, maybe also what's a little different with Rent is that it doesn't allow you to escape from what yeah. needs to be talked about, what needs to be. Um, the conversation of the day. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be really looking forward to come seeing it now and looking at it from Kelsey's perspective of how she broke things down. Um, Cause yeah. I think it was profound that the things that you brought up that as even someone that loves it and hears it, I mean, I play the soundtrack all the time in my car, in my house, and we're always quoting things from from it. We're always saying lines from it. From it, that now to see it from a different perspective is going to be. We all find ourselves quoting it so much too. It's such a quotable piece, and as much as you hate to sort of do that when you're working on it, you know, say the lines, you know, kind of tongue in cheek. Something comes up, and you, oh well, that sounds a little bit like this line that's in the show, and um, it's just so. It's so relevant. It's so quotable, and it's also so human, which is why you know what kind of makes it accessible um, to everyone, no matter what your sexual orientation, no matter where you come from, no matter what your career path is. Um, Because you know, a lot of times people say, you know, oh, it's about a group of artists, and while it is about a group of artists, in that group of artists is a lawyer, is a a a decorated um, college professor, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Is, a, is a professor, a very like a, a smart, scholarly man. Um, so it's it deals with all sorts of walks of life, it brings them all together. And 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 I can talk. I can keep you here talking about rent for days because um, I like how you I, just are sure. not looking at it from a cast member's point of view, but or maybe that's what's giving me the. The, the the nice perspective the, the that you nice are is because are is because you've done so much research about the show and about about being Maureen um, um, that you can lend these I little pieces these to the fans that really are into rent that we can now take back and we can say let's now look at this and and from a different and perspective, a different perspective. And, and it's my and mission when i come in february my 17 year old son has never seen the show he's seen the mo- like the movie of it but he's never experienced the live production that comes with it because i don't think i think that the best way to see it is to see the live version because yeah. because you just get that feeling from it um so i intend to bring him so he can kind of continue that next generational um, um voice out there that rent needs to stay around for a really long time um yeah. and kelsey i before i let you go i also just want to um um 
I know you're doing rent. So what other things does Kelsey have coming up on the horizon that we should be looking at? Because I'm instantly, I think people are going to watch this and totally fall in love with you. Um, just because you're genuine, um, I think that you you are the reason why you landed that part in Maureen is because you just are. Thank you. Um, um, so what do you have coming up that we can kind of yeah. follow your, your journey? Follow your, your journey. Well, to be completely honest, I'm, because uh, my rent journey has sort of just begun, I'm here through May of next year. So um, I'm very excited to have this nice long chunk of time with you. Um, I don't know yet what will come after. I don't know. I have no way of knowing if rent will continue on or if I'll go someplace else. But um, I have a website, I have an Instagram, I have a YouTube, and I love to post um, things about on, on my Instagram specifically, which is just my first and last name, Kelsey Swigard. Um, I love to post things about my travels. Um, my story, my Instagram story specifically is more so like the funny, quirky day to day things of, you know, you know, whatever. Um, I'm a huge foodie. I'm a huge coffee snob. Unfortunately, it's one of my least favorite things about myself. I have to be honest. I hate how much I love coffee, specifically good coffee. I can't drink things. So, um, I find all the best coffee shops in every city I go to. Um, I'm in Vancouver right now. I have to give a shout out to Timber Train Coffee Roasters and they are amazing. If you're ever in Vancouver, go to Timber Train. Um, and I love posting like covers of songs. I, I have some plans to get together with like my music director on rent and some cast members on rent. And um, you know, most of us play instruments and things. So we just love to jam and get together and um, things like that. So as far as like social media outreach, that's sort of what I like to stay up to when I'm on tour. Um, I like to maintain a, an online presence even when I'm like in, on the road um because there's so much that you miss out on while while ha having a job on the road and touring is amazing and such a dream um you know you miss out on other opportunities back home so long story short i'm on rent and if you want to follow along on my website and my youtube channel um you can find all of those things under my name and uh that's what i'll be up to in the meantime awesome well Everybody, yeah. please go check out Kelsey. Um, Kelsey, I'm going to put all of your links in the comments of this video when we, when we post it. Um, I'm also going to put a link that you can go right to um, the touring company of Rent, so you can check out when they're coming to your town. Um, take your family. Um, take your friends. This is something that you guys need to experience, um, especially because Kelsey is going to be in it, which is, like, phenomenal. Um, and and definitely go out and, and support the cast so we can see them keep coming out to our cities um, and keeping the show alive because – it just needs to stay running as long as possible. I also want to get plug there. We have rush tickets and just to, I, I, I don't want to say every venue because sometimes venues have specific rules, but like 99% of our venues, we have ticket policies, which means it's a, it's a cash only $25 front to rows ticket. You would see the show right up close. For most venues, it, it you, you get the tickets when the box office opens, which is normally two hours before the show. So if it's an 8 o'clock show, 6 o'clock, 7.30 show, 5.30, et cetera, um, line up, I mean, people line up well in advance. So that's the only risky thing is that it's not a guaranteed thing, but there is a discounted ticket opportunity to see the show in every city we go to we're on like lucky seat lottery sometimes so um if you want to look at discounted tickets that's the place to go well there you go everybody inside Buddy. scoop <laughs> you got the inside got the scoop inside. from the <laughs> from kelsey herself so go out and see if you, can, if you can't if your show in your town is sold out try to get some yeah. tickets Try to get okay. some rush tickets. Okay. It'll be worth the wait. It'll be worth your time. Worth and you can thank time. Kelsey see after you see the show. After you see the show. <laughs> you, can say, the you, can say, you, say, you can say, I saw you on a normalized podcast. And you're the yeah. one that told me to come here and get rush tickets. Rush and I'm tickets. in here. So, Kelsey. And I go to the stage door every night. So come see us afterward. We love meeting people. Well, you know who's going to well, be at the stage door when you come in February. Can't wait. Cannot wait. Awesome. And everybody, thank you so much, Kelsey, for joining. I love 
love having you on and, and, and sharing, and sharing your, experience. your experience. I think we can take so much away from your experience, your dedication, your hard work, um, your passion for what you do. Um, and, and I generally thank you for coming on and, and spending your time with me today and talking all things rent. So, um, thank you so much for having me. Thank no, you so much. No problem. So everybody, that's the Unnormalized Podcast with Frankie A and Kelsey. So everybody follow her on Instagram, on Twitter, YouTube. I'm going to put all the links in the comments to this show and everybody get unnormalized.